today is Tuesday, February 26th, 2019. This is an interview with Dr. Cyril O'Connor, Professor Emeritus, Chemical Engineering Department at the University of Cape Town, Cape Town, South Africa. The interviewer is Bridge Martgill. This interview is being conducted as part of the American Institute for Mining, Metallurgical and Petroleum Engineers Oral History Project. We are at SME Annual Meeting uh, celebrating Professor Doug Fresnel's 90th birthday. So, Cyril, um, first of all, I would appreciate if you can tell us a little bit about your childhood, your family, early family, schooling, and how did you got inspired to be an engineer? Okay, well, um, thank you, Bridge, uh, for the opportunity to, to be interviewed. Um, my All four of my grandparents came out from Ireland to South Africa in the late 19th century. And I have on record that my grandfather was illiterate, um, which I think I am also, if you ask my secretary. Um, so my two grandfathers came out to work on the mines in Kimberley, where diamonds had just been discovered. And my father, so on my paternal grandfather's side, my father was one of uh, 11 children, of whom only four reached adulthood. So in those days, infant mortality was, was quite high in, in a mining uh, town like Kimberley for what it was then. When uh, gold was discovered in Johannesburg in the late 1880s, my grandfather moved to Johannesburg, which was then just an old mining town, um, and and started working for a mine called Simmer and Jack. My maternal grandfather also moved to uh, Johannesburg, which, as I say, then was just a corrugated iron town, and we started working for a mine that became the largest gold mine in the world, Crown Mines. Both of them died sadly when my parents were in their teens. My paternal grandfather was killed in an accident, underground accident from a rockfall when my father was uh, 10. And my maternal grandfather died at a very young age of pneumoconiosis or silicosis. When my mother was, she was the eldest of four children and she was also in her teens. Um, so my parents, uh, my father left school. It's, 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 a, it's a amusing family story. He left school at what we would call today grade eight and went to work uh, for uh, what was called Rand Mines as an office boy. The big perk of being an office boy was that he got a bicycle, and he got an allowance once a month for the bicycle. And the bicycle got a puncture, and his mother wouldn't let him repair the puncture because she needed the money for housekeeping. So he used to push the bike literally to work and back every day. His older brother uh, was in the First World War, and I'm named after his older brother, who was Cyril, uh, won a, a number of distinguished medals, but died also at a young age of mustard gas poisoning from the First World War. My my mother, she was much more educated than my father. She got what we were called today grade 10, and she left school then. So I don't come from a blue-chip, highly educated background. So there were four children in our family, my father went to worked on the mines, as I, t I just told you. He started at the age of 14, and he retired at the age of 63. So he spent many years of his life on the mines. In those days, you joined the mines and you worked till retirement. Um, and his mother would never let him go underground. His father hadn't been killed underground. So he worked in a surface job, and he became what was in those days called the chief native timekeeper. There were 50,000 workers on the mine, and they, the, the timekeeping job was to monitor how many shifts they did. So the black workers were, were contracted for nine months, and then they were sent back to wherever they came from in the bush for three months, and they applied again for a new contract. And my father's job in the office, he worked. We didn't know what a university was. I, in my childhood life, I never knew anybody who went to a university. 
So I, I was um, I was brought up in a very middle class, lower middle class home. I had the advantage of being a white, with hindsight that was not a trivial advantage. And um, I went. To, I'm a Catholic, and we went to Catholic schools, and I mixed with Portuguese, Italians, everybody. And so, I, I'm, I, looking back, I, I consider myself greatly privileged to be brought up not in an elite environment, but I, I mixed with the greengrocer's son and uh, the bus conductor's son and so on. But none of us ever knew what a university was. I remember when I was not so old, maybe 14, we heard that a girl who lived up the road from us had gone to do something called a BA at Wits University. And so, there was no... So I, when I matriculated, I thought I'd like to study on, but my parents couldn't afford to send me to university. So the only way I could study on, I applied for a bursary to be to get a teacher's a diploma uh, at a teacher's training college, because then I got a bursary. So I went to a teacher's training college, and the stream I joined in was to become a high school, but not all the way to grade 12, to grade 10 maths and science teacher. In my second year, it was a three-year program, in my second year, my maths lecturer said to me, what are you doing here? I was just pretty good in maths. So I said, well, you know, I'm here because this is the only chance I've got of a higher education. So she encouraged me to register for what is known as the University of South Africa. It's a correspondent university. Very high standards, actually, uh, to register for a BSc degree through correspondence. So I started out with that. And I, if I might blow my trumpet, I, I never dropped a first in my undergraduate pro degree. So I graduated with a degree, a two double major in maths and chemistry, while I was doing school teaching. And that was a wonderful discipline because I also was appointed as a housemaster in a boarding school. So once I put the boarders to bed at night, I went and started doing my assignments. So I got used to sleeping on four hours a night sort of thing and doing my assignment. That was great. Looking back, that was a great apprenticeship. Uh, so when I eventually graduated, I really wanted to study further. And I managed to get uh, into the University of Cape Town an, an honours program in, in chemistry. And um, while I was doing that honours program, I was still teaching. So I would teach till lunchtime, go up for lectures, come back. Um, at the end of that year, one of the professors, Ernest Pratt, who was a, became very famous for the thermal decomposition of azides, azides are primary detonators, he said to me, also, what are you doing here? So I said, well, so he said, why don't you do a PhD? So I said, you're mad. So he said, no, do a PhD. And he was, a, if I talk about mentors, he was a fantastic mentor. Uh, in fact, if you read Octave Levenspiel's famous book, you'll see the Pratt-Tompkins equation, which is to model the decomposition of azides. And so I did the PhD in the, the, uh, the irradiated, co-irradiated and thermal decomposition of azides. And all of my predecessors went to work for AECI, which was one of the world's largest manufacturers of explosives. Um, so when I finished my PhD, another professor... In chemi a professor in chemical engineering came and said to me, he met me, and he said, why don't you, there's a, we've got two vacancies in chemical engineering, and we're looking for physical chemists. And he, I remember him saying to me, he said, in the United States, it's becoming fairly common that a physical chemist can switch over to chemical engineering. I had applied for a job with AECI. Um, I also applied for a job with Sasol. And I, I then applied for this academic post without any thought that I'd ever get it. But I told the two companies when I went for interviews around about October of that year, I had applied for this job at the University in Chemical Engineering. And um, they both said to me, well, look, if you get the job, come back to us because maybe we can start some research programs. So what happened was I got the job. Uh, in chemical engineering, and I was told, Chum, on the 10th of February the following year, you will take over lecturing reaction, reactor design one, reactor design two, and thermodynamics. Sandler's book, Thermodynamics, Octave Levenspiel. So talk about a steep learning curve. 
But that was great. So I wrote to them and I said, look, I've, I've got the job in chemical engineering. There was there were two postgraduates in the department at the time. Today there are 160 postgraduates in the same department. So I started in two areas. Oh, at the same time, um, NIM uh, heard about me and a chap called Rob Dunn was working at NIM. And he came down to Cape Town and he said, you know, we'd like to start some flotation research here in Cape Town. I said, what's this flotation thing? So, so I started out. I went to see the Deputy Vice Chancellor, who had been the former head of chemical engineering. I said to Donald Carr, I said, Donald, I'm thinking of starting catalysis and I'm thinking of starting flotation. He said, now that's a good idea because when the one goes down, the other one may come up, so you can trade off. So that's 35 years ago. And what's happened today is that the catalysis group, which I founded, is now a huge center of excellence. My first PhD student went off to work for Sutkemi, then he came to the States to work for Phillips Petroleum. And um, I'm jumping ahead a bit. I managed to get him back. So he's running the catalysis group. I ran the flotation group, which then became the center for minerals processing. In the meantime, what happened to me was I was in chemical engineering. I, <clears throat> in 1988, I became the head of chemical engineering until 1999 when I was appointed dean. And from 1999 to 2008, I was dean and then a dean of the engineering and built environment faculty. Because what happened then was we brought the architects and the quantity surveyors and the geometricians into our faculty. And I want to tell you, dealing with architects is another story. But uh, dealing with chemical engineers is much easier. Uh, so, and then in 2009, we got a new vice chancellor, and I've been on that selection committee. And he asked me, would I act as a deputy vice chancellor? I was going to retire the following year. So I acted as a deputy vice chancellor, and then I retired. And uh, I always joked that it must have been a postal strike on when I retired. I never got the retirement letter. But I saw my bank account the next month. But then I was I was retained. Anglo American had given me a personal chair, and I was never able to take it up uh, while I was dean and deputy vice chancellor. And so the vice chancellor allowed me my first three years of retirement to take up the Anglo chair. And that chair has been now tron it's a permanent chair. So my successor Dave Deglon has now got the Anglo American chair in minerals processing. So yeah, that's. And here I am today in Denver. So you mentioned about your interest in mathematics and chemistry early on, and that the teacher, mathematics teacher, I guess, uh, asked you to yeah. go for higher studies. Why? So how did you develop the interest, and was well, that teacher one of the early mentors for you who inspired you to well, go for higher education? Well, I, I think... I think my, my earliest mentor was my mother. My father was a hard worker, and I'll tell you, my father was an interesting person because in those days they used dipping pens with ink. In fact, when we were at school, we used dipping pens. We used to come home from school with ink order, and my father could run down a table of figures, and he could add them up quicker than a calculator can today. So I think he had a – but he had only gone to school till he was 13, 14. My mother was very good on – Figures. So I was blessed because there were four of us children and we would come home from school and my mother, she was she was a housewife and a mother, and she would sit with us watching our homework and taking us. And I think I, I let, we, we fell in love with figures. My two brothers, my, my sister was elder. She died, sadly, of, of, of a brain tumor when she was 28. But my other two brothers were all, did also, also did very well. They never went to university. They both went into the banking world. And they rose to very high positions without a degree. So I'm still the odd man out with a university education, which they mock me about. Because I think they made more money than I did. <laughs> yeah. Very good. So now, with regard to uh, your profession, uh, you covered quite a bit of it. That you had opportunity to work in industry and then got an opportunity to uh, teach at, in the chemical engineering department. So you must have seen a lot of changes through your years as a faculty, then as a dean, and then deputy pro, yes. uh, provost or de deputy chancellor. Well, if I go back to 
how I started my research. Um, serendipitously, I, I, as I said, I joined the department. We had a very strong pre- professor who did his PhD at, uh, at University of, of uh, Philadelphia, in, in Philadelphia in biochemical engineering. In fact, one of his colleagues then became the president of Lehigh University. He's passed on now, that colleague of mine. And um, he suggested to me, you, you've got to go out and meet the industry. So I always, I've always told my young colleagues today, we didn't have any money in the department. So I got a second-class train ticket from Cape Town to Johannesburg, which was two nights, two days. And I went and visited Sassel. Sassel then was just on the verge of a big boom. In fact, it's always an interesting story to relate that of the biggest projects in history, calculated in terms of money spent, the biggest project in history was the Apollo Space Program. The third largest project in history was the Alaskan Oil Pipeline. And the second largest project in history was Sassel 2 and 3. They were giant plants. And and uh, so I got into Sassel, working with Sassel, at just the right time. There was quite a lot of money, so I could recruit students. On the mining side, uh, working on flotation, which was also a, just the right time, I was very lucky because gold was running at $800 an ounce. The RAND was very strong. There was a lot of money in the country. There were no serious centers of excellence except for Peter King at Wits in Common Usha, and you know Peter. And so I was able to... Let me put it this way, there was, to be, to be sort of pretty brutal about it, there was no much competition. You know, if I just worked hard, I, I would be able to, to um, make a success of those. And hard work was, I'd learned that to do my degree by correspondence. So I had a lucky break, I had good students, and, and both areas took off. I was waiting for one of them to collapse, and they both took off, and until today, they're two of the largest research centers in the university, in fact. Um, and and so you asked me, you know, what what it got me going in working with those areas. I think it was the opportunity. I've always been felt very strongly. You shouldn't do any project in engineering without, unless you know that there's somebody out there who would be interested in. And so I've always had a strong view that I wanted to have an industry person co-supervising my project. So and of course the people love to come to Cape Town, so it was not difficult to get them. So, yeah, and I suppose, again, the rest is history. I, was, I had a lucky break, and, but, you know, like the, my great South African golfer, Gary Player, always says, the harder you practice, the luckier you get. So, yeah. So, uh, during your time, then you also, there was a lot of political changes which yeah. came through. So how did that help you uh, to grow as a professional well, and that, also yeah, to implement those policies? And well, it's interesting that, you know, um, in the early 1980s, we were in chemical engineering at the University of Cape Town. We were approached by Shell. And Shell wanted to get us to take on what they call Shell Scholars. These were super bright black students from from largely often rural areas. They would go to the rural areas and ask the school principal, who's your top student? And they would take these students and they came in cohorts of about 12, breaking the law. We weren't allowed to take black students at UCT, but we had a fantastic vice-chancellor, Stuart Saunders, who's still alive today. He just decided we'll break the law. And in fact, he set up a special residence so that they wouldn't have to live in the so-called white residences. And it was an eye-opener at Bridge, and I think, to me, I, 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 I'm pretty confident. You know, we have, still have a strong transformation agenda in the country. But I get a little bit frustrated about it, because when I see my black students, I don't see black. I see students. I see nice students, and I see not-so-nice students, and I see fantastic students, and I don't see black anymore, because we don't have to use a person's color to reward them with a senior position. And I've always felt, in the early days, I think that was right. But but the students today that we've got in chemical engineering at UCT, uh, University of Cape Town was really a trailblazer uh, nationally in breaking the mold. Uh, and I always remember one day, um, 
the vice chancellor has a lovely story which he told me personally. He, it was Friday afternoon and he was in his office at half past four and he got a phone call from somebody saying, can I come and see you? Because I'm very impressed with what you're doing at the University of Cape Town with black students doing engineering. So Stuart said, he said to the chap, yes, fine, come. So a taxi arrived. Most of the admin people had gone home. It was five o'clock Friday afternoon. The chap arrived. Stuart brought him into his office in the vice chancellor's office. They met for an hour. And then he said, look, the, chap, the visitor said, I'll get back to you. So he took his name. And he said, can I take you into town? So the visitor said, well, that's very kind of you. So he took him into town, saw the hotel he was staying at, said to his, his secretary on Monday morning, just phone this hotel to check that this is for real. It was George Soros, one of the world's wealthiest men. You know, the famous George Soros brought the Bank of England down. And George Soros became a big funder of UCT to promote black students getting scholarships and so on. So... What did it do? What did it do for me as a white? Uh, I said to you earlier, I, I I don't come from a. I wasn't born with a silver spoon in my mouth, but I had the advantage of being a white. There's no question about it. But it helped me to understand that in fact we were missing out on such a rich reservoir of talent in our country for 40 years. Fortunately, it was only 40 years. Um, the apartheid officially came in in 1948. And so you can say 1990, when Mandela was released, is roughly so. You can say it was 40 years. Those 40 years were lost years. And we've just had such fantastic students come through. In the Center for Minerals Research at the moment, we've got 55 postgraduates, masters and doctorate, of whom I would say uh, 70% are black. Uh, I must say this, though. There's an amazing phenomenon in Africa. The students... The, Zimbabwe is a total basket case. It's a country that has been destroyed by Mugabe. But the Zimbabwean students are among the best I've ever had. It's something that they did in that country to keep the education system going in the schools. Whereas in South Africa, the schools are pretty broken. So what we did in engineering... Before I became dean, my predecessor started it. We were, we set up a thing called ASPEC, Academic Support Program for Engineers. So stu black students would go into this, and they were put on a five-year program. So we gave them three years to do the first two years because they had to play catch-up. But what was amazing, there are stories of students arriving from rural areas, put them in the ASPEC program, and after two weeks you realize, hold it a second, they should be in the mainstream. And Noko Pala today, who's one of the vice presidents of Anglo-America, was one of those students. He arrived. After two weeks, they said Noko shouldn't be in there. He got straight first for chemical engineering, did a PhD. So what has it done? It's just shown me that we, we, we lost so many years, but fortunately we can play catch-up. And we've got brilliant students. And I'm not saying that just to be nice. They are really good students. And I think we've now got to a point in our history where you really can judge a person on their competence, their ability, their personality, not their race. So with regard to the switchover, bringing black students, breaking the law, um, did you feel that the rest of the faculty members were as supportive of those policies? Oh, yes. The uh, University of Cape Town had a long history a long history of liberalism. And and there's no question that that at the time the Shell scholars came in, we could see the change starting to happen. There were rumors about the president starting to talk to Mandela. Mandela was moved into Palsmoor prison from Robben Island. So th there was a change. And in fact, we, we got, it was a tense time. You know, it was tense because the black people were angry quite rightly, and the white, many white people, and I'm not going to say that I wasn't one of them, felt that they didn't have to do what they did. I mean, there were terrible murders taking place, and all black on black. But but, but the, there was no question that we got excited about it. Sadly, sadly, that excitement, of course, happened when Mandela became president. And um, we had a vice-chancellor, Mampela Rampele, who's still a very close friend of mine, the first black vice-chancellor university, whose ex late husband or husband was a chap called Steve Biko, 
who became a very famous man in the struggle in history of South Africa. Killed by the police. She had a child by Steve. She was a medical doctor. She was a very close friend of Mandela. She eventually went off to become vice president of the World Bank in Washington. And I remember when she got that offer, she was a close friend of mine. She invited me down to her house. And she said, I've got to talk to, um, uh, what did she call? No, he was, he was affectionately called Madiba. But uh, he found, she was found him. Is he happy with her leaving to go to Washington to the World Bank? She didn't stay more than five years there. It wasn't the sort of place she wanted to stay. But then we had a sequence of uh, dispensations. And the tragedy was the appointment of Zuma as the president of our country in 2009. And, and and today, as I speak, commissions of inquiry have been set up and bridge. Those, those are another 10 lost years of corruption and greed and just appalling uh, uh, corruption. And fortunately, we, we've got a new president, Cyril Ramaphosa, who's an outstanding chap. And there's a good mood in the country again. But uh, it's been a rocky road. We always say Africa is not for sissies. <laughs>
as applied research or or fundamental research. There's only there are two types of research: good research and bad research. And so Harry, that's a that's a Harry Irving saying. There are only two types of research: good research and bad research. So yeah, that's his. You were faculty, you were department chair, dean, and then deputy vice chancellor. So I'm sure you met some tough cookies during your time. So you had a lot of successes to your credit, and there must have been a lot of challenges too. Any challenge which sta stands out in your mind, and, and how did you deal with it? I think... Um I think in those days, dealing with uh, racial, racially uh, based problems was tricky, because although I said earlier there was a great buy-in by everybody, the mood was still, you know, in the in the nineties, the mood was still, um, let's say, we were in we were in rehab mode, and so. A lot of we we started appointing quite a few black academics. We had a special program. We would we would create an extra post in a department on condition was filled by a black, which was con con contentious because that person always felt labelled as the add-on. But we would say after three years that person's got to go into a full-time post. So handling those sorts of tensions were were often tricky. But I think I just learned, and again I think I only learned from from my parents. You've got to be honest. You can be kind and gentle and sensitive, but you've got to be honest with people. Um, I remember having to close down a department of materials engineering because it was just too small. It had sprung out of mechanical engineering, and I wanted to put it back into mechanical engineering. And uh, that was very unpopular with the, the incumbents. They weren't going to lose their jobs. Uh, but I think I learned a lot that you, you've got to take these challenges on. There's no point in ducking and diving. So. And at the end of the day, I found people people are basically very good. Once the dust has settled, and so long as they know that you are acting in the interests of the, the body corporate, so to speak, and not in your own interests. Um, so I, I think uh, the other great blessing I have, and if my former deputy heads of departments and my former deputy deans would yeah, they'd laugh and nod their heads. I was a great delegator. But you have to delegate, and I was I was I was fantastically lucky to be surrounded by really good people. So I was able to appoint the first woman deputy dean, the first black deputy dean, and I saw that that was exciting because you could see these people starting to come through and and learn on the job, so to speak. Um, so I was lucky to have a lot of good people around me. But I think you've got to make your luck. You've got to find those people and trust in them. You've been training students for a long period of time at all different levels, undergraduate, graduate, PhDs, and so forth. Have you seen any transitions coming through in the preparations of the student, which has really stood out and is very positive, and there may be some areas which uh, perhaps are not so positive? Well, let me say, unfortunately, I would say we've got quite a lot of not so positive issues, and that that is that the quality of the high school graduate arriving chemical engineering after medicine is the most difficult program to get into at our university the top program to get into is the mbchb um, and after that chemical engineering so we get in the creme de la creme but and I'm, I'm not i'm not that close to the classroom right at the moment but i see them as a graduate because they're coming to the master's program they they just don't they, they haven't they don't seem to have basic fundamental mathematics, for example. I mean, I, I, I enjoy saying to a master student, what is a logarithm? They've got no idea. It's a button on a calculator. They don't know what a log is. I said, define a log. I asked them, what is pH? They don't know. And they've, they've just become chemical engineers. So, so I think we're missing a few tricks here. We're assuming that they're learning these things at school because when I was a school kid, you learnt what a log is. A log of a number is an index of the power to which the base must be raised to get the number. <laughs> I still remember it today. So, so we and I think I, I'm also I'm a bit old, I, I'm, I am old-fashioned, but 
I hear, uh, by the way, you know, let me just say that uh, my wife and I, we were both career people. My wife was a pharmacist who went into pharmacokinetics, and at the age of late 30s, we married. So I haven't got children, but I've got loads of nieces and nephews and hangers on, so to speak. But but I, I, I'm appalled when I meet my nieces and nephews and their children. They spend their lives doing projects, projects. And all they do is they Google these projects. And I said, but what is the educational value of a project? Why don't they just make sure that they can do their tables, that they can do simple mathematics, solve an equation? And I always thought that was fun. You know, when you, when you first discovered algebra, it was so exciting to find out what X was equal to. But today, I don't think the teachers themselves. Now, I, I don't know what it's like in the United States, but but of course we have pockets of excellence because with the with the quality of high school education being in the government schools not that great, with with many exceptions, by the way, it's a huge generalisation. Private school education is booming in South Africa, and and they are excellent. Now people have got to pay. Um, but those kids arriving at the, our university, very, they're, they're as good as they were 50 years ago. And when anybody tells me standards are dropping, I say, look, I can remember in the 70s, you know, there were kids around who couldn't solve a simple quadratic equation. So I don't think standards have dropped, but I think the, the, uh, the basic grounding they've received in their high school uh, for a, for a, to study chemical engineering is is flawed, to be quite blunt.